Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presented by the Division of Extended Education at the University of Manitoba. I'm Karen Walschuk, and I will be your host for this session. In a few moments, we'll begin our discussion on the challenges and opportunities generative AI technologies present, particularly in the context of lifelong learning. I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Prior to introducing our speakers, I'd like to advise our audience that you can use the Q&A function to submit any questions you might have. We'll keep a close eye on those questions and integrate them into our discussion as the best we can and within our time constraints. I'd like to now introduce our speakers. Our first panel member is Dr. Rod Lastra. Rod is a lifelong learning professional with over 20 years of high impact experience in higher education. Rod brings a wealth of knowledge from over seven years in academic administration. He currently serves as the president of the Canadian Association for University Continuing Education, where his contributions have made a significant mark both nationally and internationally in university continuing education. Currently on a research study leave, Rod is dedicating his expertise to two critical areas, analyzing labor market trends to enhance higher education programming and exploring the transformative impact of AI on lifelong learning. His work is centered around creating synergies between educational strategies and evolving market demands and harnessing the power of AI to enrich adult education. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Sharples, Emeritus Professor of Educational Technology at the Open University UK. Mike gained a PhD from the Department of Artificial Intelligence, University of Edinburgh on cognition, computers, and creative writing. His expertise involves human-centered design and evaluation of new technologies and environments for learning. He's also an associate editor of the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence in Education. As academic lead for the FutureLearn company, he led the design of its social learning approach provides consultancy for institutions worldwide, including UNESCO, UNICEF, universities and companies. Mike founded the Innovating Pedagogy Report Series and is author of over 300 papers in the areas of educational technology, learning sciences, science education, human-centered design of personal technologies, artificial intelligence and cognitive science. We're so pleased you could join us today, Mike. And now I'll pass it over to Rod to start today's discussion. Thank you, Karen. Welcome everyone and welcome, Mike. It's a real pleasure and honor to have you here today. Uh, I really look forward to this conversation, which I uh, anticipate will be extremely interesting for those who are signing on to listen. Um, as Karen uh, highlighted, um, for me, this is a really exciting opportunity to speak to uh, a person who I consider to be one of the frontiers in uh, the the area of of computational learning. Um, we've been talking quite a bit lately uh, about the impacts of AI uh, on education and on society as a whole. Um, and um, Mike has been uh, working on this uh, his entire career. And so I think that he's going to bring a very unique perspective, not just a, a recent modality to to the topic, but a very unique perspective uh, on an entire career based on um, what he knows about the impacts of learning theory, um, learning styles, technology, um, and again, uh, perhaps a unique perspective on what, uh, what generative AI can and perhaps cannot do. Um, so with over, I mean, you know, quite impressively, you know, 300 papers plus 28,000 citations. Uh, I think I was checking Google on that. A very impressive uh, a body of work. Um, so my my first question to you, Mike, is really more of a reflective question. Uh, based on your career, uh, based on what you've um, worked through in the last 40 plus years, 
Could you maybe provide a a bit of a reflection on your journey, uh, what you've um, um, experienced, what you've acknowledged, what you have been involved in when it comes to this intersectionality between uh, um, computational learning and um, and the individual? Well, firstly, thank you for inviting me, and it's great to be here. Um, for reflection, I was, I think, privilege to join the Department of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh in the late 1970s, uh, just as uh, it was developing a, a research and a program in educational technology. And my PhD there was on generative AI. Uh, and I guess I was one of the first people to do a PhD in generative AI. Um, I developed software to help children explore um, creative writing uh, and to explore language through programs that could generate text. And so the first thing to say is that you know, generative AI isn't new. There's a long and fascinating history behind it. Um, and you know, we do tend to think about um, AI and education technology being something that's just evolved in the last few years. It hasn't, and we need to understand that history. Um, in AI, there, there hasn't been a linear progression. There have been waves, uh, and I joined um, the AI department just as one of the first waves was coming around expert systems um, and the Japanese fifth generation project when it was thought that Japan was going to, to rule the world in AI. And there have been rises and falls since then. And what happens with every boom and then disillusion is that AI doesn't go away, but it just gets embedded into the tools we use. So search engines have got AI behind them, recommender systems. So I think that's the first thing to say, that you know, AI hasn't just progressed in an even way. Um, on my own journey, I started out developing tools to support children in their writing development. I then went on to design intelligent tutoring systems, uh, a tutoring system for neuroradiology. And it took 12 years to develop that tutoring system. And I think the difference now is that what, you know, in that time would take 10, 12 years to do in a meticulous way, specifying all the different rules, the structures, uh, trying to understand how humans uh, carry out tutoring, understanding the pedagogy. All of that is now getting embedded into generative AI so that you have you know, teaching, tutoring systems, personalized learning for any topic. Now that's exciting because it means that we can offer personalized learning to people around the world who have internet access on any topic. But what you've lost, I think, is that ability to understand in depth both the structure of the topic and also the pedagogy, the teaching and learning. And I think we'll come back to that, just the importance of being able to understand how people learn and how we can teach, which I fear is getting lost in the data-driven AI. So my journey has been from um, the early days of AI in education through tutoring systems, through tools to support learning, and now engaging with this new era of generative AI. And it's been fascinating. Thanks, Mike. You know, I think I think you raise a really important point uh, that uh, perhaps many of our listeners uh, already know, and maybe some don't. Is that you know the the history of artificial intelligence goes back to the 1940s, and in fact, you know there are two, what they call kind of the AI winters that occurred, uh, but there's been somewhat of a linear progression on that. Um, based on what you just said, and I'm going to ask a really odd question, but if you can reflect back to the early days or late days of 2022. Um, um, when uh, the public access to uh, chat. A GPT came out, uh, and I know that you were dabbling with with the previous versions. Um, from your perspective, what was a surprising element about this? 
what was kind of the 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 pivot point in the technology from your point of view? I think what surprised me was context. And let me let me just give an example. So uh, at that time in 19, uh, 2020 to 2022, I was writing a book called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers, about the history of generative AI and language. And with an early version of um, GPT, I asked it to generate a story. Um, and I gave it the title of The Happy Spider. Um, so a story for children called The Happy Spider. And it generated something that looked pretty much like a children's story about a child who went up to a spider's web and there was a spider who greeted her. Um, and I thought, how does this system know that in the context of a children's story, you can have a spider web that you can climb up and a talking spider that can interact with a child. So it wasn't just that it was generating language, it also seemed to have some understanding of context, uh, of you know, what the context of a child's story is. And that's what surprised me, because up until then, the you know, there were generative AI systems where either you had to hold that context in very carefully or that context just wasn't there. So you've now got general purpose contextual language generators that could write a story, it could write an academic essay, it could write a research report. It was contextual generative AI, and that's what surprised me. So, so really, it's the it's you know what many have called the emergent properties because I think many have reported on this. The experts even say emergent properties in the sense that uh, when you're looking at those neural networks and the large language models, um, it's not a simple transparent box. In other words, the the output what you're getting from the system, the the ability to not only follow. Uh, the basic rules of linguistics, but to understand context, as you said, and to apply uh, very basic logic in that process, the outputs, it's sometimes baffling, despite the error. But could you maybe elaborate a little bit, because I know you, you've spoken about this on the past, that GPT is more than just a predictive word, uh, uh, a generator, it does more than that. It is, it's, 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 it's more complex, right? Yes, it is. Um, so, you know, people have said that it's it's just a stochastic parrot. It's just, uh, you know, taking data and repurposing it. It's doing more than that. It's doing more than sentence completion. It's building some kind of internal model, and we still don't understand that internal model. Um, but it's got layers. It's got, you know, a layer of syntax, of language structure, of semantics. Behind that, there seems to be some kind of emergent world model. Now, it's very incomplete, and this is where you know, there are problems, because at the moment it doesn't have a good understanding of causality about how the world works. But it seems to have these emergent properties, such that, for example, um, I gave it a quite complex diagram, um, a diagram about learning as conversation. And it was just a picture, it wasn't even you know, uh, text uh, that was in you know, easily readable form. But it could not only interpret the text in that diagram, but also the relations between it, the lines that connected them, and then asked it to simplify that diagram. And it did that. So it's doing something more than just text completion or um, text processing. It's interpreting structure um, and it's interpreting you know, relations and context. Now, quite how it does that, we don't know. And this is you know, a real concern because there are still things that it gets wrong. Um, it doesn't have a good picture of you know, how the world works, how one part of the world connects to another. It's not able to see the things that we can see because it's not connected um, to uh, you know, a good you know, emerging process, visual representation of the world. But it can do a great deal more than just process text. It can understand structure and context. 
And I and I think there's where the the peril and the the promise lies, and that's technology, right? So the promise is maybe in in the ability for it to do just what you're saying, in the ability to be able to um, process information and contextualize information. Uh, many have written, and I, and you and I have talked about this offline, about its ability to be able to translate. And I'm not just talking translating in terms of languages. I'm saying translating in terms of complex ideas, scientific papers, being able to, to decipher information, uh, which I think is really important. But it really begs a question that, that you and I will get into a little bit later, is entry-level use. So for someone who has a background in, in a, a specific a domain of knowledge, using a tool like this is powerful because it augments. But any reflections for someone who doesn't have that foundational knowledge? Well, firstly, we need to use it with great care. Um, and it should never, at the, certainly at the moment, it should never become a substitute, for example, for human teaching. It can be an adjunct to it. But if you try to use it as a substitute for human teaching, then you know you are, are going to you know you're not going to be able to evaluate when it makes mistakes and it still does make mistakes you need to be able to have a way of evaluating its output to be able to reconcile that with not only your knowledge but also you know, the uh, evidence correct information so you know, it should always be used in you know, a teaching situation with a human teacher. And you know, I've said a number of times that teaching is a caring profession. Uh, you know, we care about our students, we care about knowledge, we care about truth, and AI is intrinsically uncaring. Or, uh, and so we need to be able to use it in the context of you know, human care and mentoring. Having said that, it's an in incredibly powerful tool. It can do things like summarize texts. Uh, you know, one of the most valuable areas is to take a complicated um, scientific paper, say, and extract the essence from it. It can now do translation from one language to another, um, and it can do comparisons as well. So you can ask it to you know, compare text, you can ask it to simplify diagrams, and it can be used as a I think there are two main areas where AI can be used by people who you know, are starting out in this. One is to do some of the mundane tasks that you really don't want to do, but you have to do. Um, so in teaching, for example, in lesson planning, it can be enormously useful for teachers for lesson planning. And the other is an aid to creativity. It can you know all the way through the creative process it can be an aid in terms of brainstorming, helping you with design, um, helping you with uh, you know, creating new products, evaluating outputs. So it can be a tool for design. And I think those are the two you know, main advantages at the moment to help you with mundane tasks and as a tool for creativity. What it isn't is it's not yet a really good um, knowledge base or representation of the world. Um, it can't do deep and complex problem solving. But if you see it as a tool for creativity, then it can be enormously valuable. And that's really interesting because it does get into this re very, I guess, existential question or or, or idea about the, pr the main problem with AI is AI. And I think I think you highlighted kind of the potential use of it as a very powerful tool, but the problem is is that it has no agency. It, it's 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 very agnostic. It's uh, I think many have said it, including yourself. It's amoral in terms of its you know responses. And I think the application of keep talking about it as if it it it's a proxy to human intelligence. It's wrong. What we should be saying is how can it augment human intelligence? intelligence and capabilities. And that's where I think the promise lies, correct? I think that's right. It's not a proxy for human intelligence, and it shouldn't be seen as that. Um, for a start, it doesn't have human experience. You know? It's never seen a sunset. It's never smelt human mown grass. So all of its experience about in relation to human experiences you know, accreted secondhand through its data structures. 
it does have, interestingly, its, its own experience. So as these AI tools become connected to the web, then it will be able to collect emerging and evolving data from the web, and it will gain experience of interacting with you know, other web tools in ways that perhaps we couldn't. And it's already been used, for instance, in finance and business for doing stock market analysis, um, you know, a business prediction. So it's not that it doesn't have experience. It does, but it has a different kind of experience to human experience. And therefore, it can become an adjunct, it can become a tool, but it's not a substitute. Exactly. Um, let's get into a little bit of kind of your area of specialty, which is, um, you know, computer assisted writing. And and I think that you uh, wrote about this in uh, Story Machines, which is a great book. It, and uh, one of the things I found really interesting, which I didn't know, was um, there were some early publications in the 1990s uh, with expert systems that were kind of using logical uh, uh, coding in order to create, I guess it was romance books, right? But very primary books. Um, so again, this idea of computers writing, it's not new, but now we're getting into a new domain, right? So universities and, you know, specifically and, and, and K to 12 are really preoccupied with the implications of the use of, uh, of these tools. Any, any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so I mean, amazingly, the first novel that was generated with computer was in 1992 um, by a guy called Scott French. But he spent eight years in trying to um, encode the style of just one novelist. Um, and to do that in a very explicit way, uh, you know, trying to replicate the style um, of that uh, one particular novelist. Um, now, what you have is the ability to replicate lots of different styles. So, you know, if you want to write poetry in um, you know, the style of Shakespeare, you can do that. If you want to write a Shakespearean sonnet, if you want to write a modernist novel, you can. And if you want to write a student essay, you can. And so from you know, this is where I think um, the concern, but also the excitement about AI and education took off. Um, back in 2020 now, mm -hmm. I was writing the Story Machines book and I started to think about how you know, this technology, which at that time was just being discussed in relation to you know, business and the re relation to professional writing, what impact it could have in education. So I uh, asked GPT-3 as it was then um, to write a student essay. And it did a pretty good job. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it looked like a student essay. And then as the um, technologies evolved, you know, that has got more and more successful. It still makes occasional mistakes, but you know, it can you know, perform as a writer. So obviously there was concern. You know, what's the impact of this going to be on um, traditional assessment, the 5,000 word essay or the 3,000 word essay, if students can write an essay at the touch of a button. And so this is where, you know, some of the um, deep concern of universities and uh, education institutions started that we've got this technology in the hands of students, unlike other technologies that have come from the top down, technologies in the hands of students that are going to disrupt traditional education. Um, now, the first thing to say is that, um, yes, it's powerful. Yes, it can write student essays. Um, but you know, all of the evidence of working with students and student panels is that students don't want to cheat. Um, they, want to, um, they want to learn, they want to pass exams, but they don't want to cheat. So you know, I think the first thing that universities, colleges, and schools now need to do is to work with students to develop you know, a strategy, a reasonable approach to how we can adapt and adopt this technology into education. It is going to mean transformation, particularly transformation of assessment. 
but also it's opening up a whole lot of opportunities, as I've mentioned, around design, for example. So I've worked with you know, a large number of universities over the past year. Um, what they're trying to do is develop strategy that allows them to adapt, but in a way that supports good learning, good pedagogy. And that's been you know, my aim, is to say it's not just a matter of uh, disrupting traditional education, but it's opening opportunities towards new ways of teaching and learning. Um, teaching and learning around dynamic assessment, uh, providing students with personalized tutors and guides, um, offering opportunities for uh, creativity. Um, and also, if the AI can create, if you like, mundane pieces of writing, then firstly, we can use that to critique those mundane pieces of writing and then see how we can rise above them. So I did some work recently with University of the Arts in London. And one of the um, academics there said, oh, my students now have a tool that can do mundane creativity. They can create mundane works of art. They can create mundane pieces of writing. But we don't want our students to be mundane. We don't want them to be average. We want them to be you know, creative, expressive, and exceptional. So there is then the issue of how do you rise above that? How do you firstly critique what AI does and then say, what is it that helps people to rise above that and helps their students to rise above it, to be exceptional? And I think that's a challenge for education now to try and you know, develop exceptional students, not just ones who churn out 3000 word essays. Right. So in many ways, I mean, I think the the push is really to to um, foster more creative thinking, more authentic assessments, kind of rethinking the entire you know, a pedagogy framework based on the notion that detection is not a hundred percent game, meaning AI detection is far from perfect. In fact, I will say, uh, for fun, I put in one of my really old papers, you know, something I had written years ago into an AI detector, and believe it or not, it came back with a warning. Uh, and I can tell you for sure that nothing was written using AI back then. Um, so, so how do we do that? Like, how do we move the needle towards something that is a little bit progressive, that is encouraging thoughtful insight from students? I mean, firstly, you're right that AI detectors don't work. So you know, basically AI detectors are um, pieces of software that attempt to detect whether a student or an AI has written a piece of writing. And they basically work on pattern matching. The idea is that if the writing is more uniform, it's probably written by AI. If it's more varied, it's probably written by humans, but it's not at all reliable. It makes mistakes, it has false positives. Um, so, we can't rely on technology to solve the problem of you know, our students writing essays with AI or not. So it's also an opportunity and it's an opportunity to rethink assessment. Now it's something you know, we've been talking about for years about how you can have more effective means of assessment. So you mentioned authentic assessment. So authentic assessment is you know, assessment that's based on for example, um, practical activities such as lab activities, um, in placements, um, project work. You can have assessment that's based on group work uh, and also process-based assessment where you assess students' learning in a number of stages and they'll also get them to reflect on their um, continuing progress. So there are a whole set of ways that are actually more effective uh, in really um, understanding students, not just learning at one particular point in time, but their progression in terms of their learning journey and how they can be helped along that learning journey. Uh, and um, it's not simply a matter of trying to evade AI, but a matter of having more appropriate and authentic assessment. And this is an opportunity to do that. Um, 
and also to use AI as a tool in that assess assessment. So for example, students might be using AI guides and tutors that will be helping them along that learning journey. And so long as they acknowledge that, that's fine. So long as they learn from it, that's fine. Uh, and then that journey can be assessed as the student progresses. So there are good ways to do assessment that isn't just assessing at one point in time with a standard piece of writing. Right. I mean, and and I guess it also kind of begs the question as well that um, back in the day, there were concerns about calculators, but you can ban you know, calculators, you can restrict, you know, phones in the classroom. Um, but day by day, AI technologies are becoming much more immersive and much more integrated in everything we do. So you don't even need to have a chat GPT account or a Gemini account in order to start using um, AI. So the idea of banning it gets in the way of the fact that it's so it's it's becoming so integrated in our everyday world. Yes, and I think that's a really important thing to say. You know, AI isn't an it. Um, it's, you know, there are many different variations of varieties of AI. AI is already embedded into search engines, into recommender systems, uh, in credit rating systems. So and that's the previous generation of AI. Um, what this new type of AI, the generative AI, can do is be embedded in all of the tools that we use. You know, Microsoft is already embedded, embedding it into its office suite, so is Google. Interestingly, Apple never mentions the word AI. Um, what it's just trying to do is to take AI technology, but just put it into everything that it has. Same with Adobe. So all of the tools that we use in the future will have AI components, and they will just be there to help and assist you. So Microsoft Word will have a button just saying continue, and it will just you know, continue to write the next paragraph. Now, it then opens the question of how do we use it in ways that are really going to benefit us. And there was a recent paper um, that was looking at our student guides and helpers with AI actually helping them to learn, or are they just substituting for learning? Are they just, you know, is it a bit like the pocket calculator that instead of learning how to do arithmetic, you just hand it over to the machine? At the moment, it seems like they are um, kind of substitutes for learning. So one of the things we really need to do is to see how we can use them as ways to help us to learn, not just as substitutes. Um, and I think that's you know a real challenge. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a much bigger challenge than how do you rethink assessment, which is how do you use these tools to help students to learn, not just as a substitute for learning. And this is something I, I had talked about a little, little bit with Salcon uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, the, the intersection, about ways of augmenting those guardrails. Myself, I've been encouraging my, my, my two children to utilize uh, uh, AI in, in a very restrictive way, but in a, in a conversive way way in a way that really uh, enables them to understand complex ideas uh, but you know there have to be some guardrails put in place but when it's done it's a really powerful thing that's right <clears throat> it is uh, and i think those guardrails are not just ethical guardrails you know, so we do need ethical guardrails um, to make sure that the AI is, uh, it's appropriate, it's not biased, uh, it represents diverse um, backgrounds uh, and cultures. But for education, it needs to be more than that. You need to have not educational guardrails, but educational designs of AI. And it's something we haven't yet um, really looked into, which is how education institutions can work along with AI companies to develop AI systems that have educational principles embedded in them. And by that, I mean, um, think about the design of a language model that is based on educational principles, where, for example, it's designed so that it um, doesn't just give an answer, but explains an answer step by step. That doesn't just you know tell the student what to do, 
that helps the student to be able to do it. Um, that um, doesn't just give a single answer, maybe gives a set of answers and suggests the students compare those answers. You can build that into the design of an educational AI system. And I think, you know, we really need to think what are the, the pedagogy principles that we want um, to enshrine in AI? And we know what makes for good learning, things like getting students to set goals, helping them to um, learn step by step, um, to achieve mastery learning before, so to master a topic before they go on to the next one, to do peer learning, to teach each other. So you can design AI systems that support these good educational principles. But it means that people who really understand education working together with the AI companies. And to me, that's exciting. And we haven't, I don't think, really you know, approached that yet. I think that you know, countries and education institutions are still rather fearful of AI rather than seeing it as something that they can participate in. You know, we're not just consumers of AI. We can really you know, guide the design of new AI systems. And I'm hoping that education institutions are going to work with AI companies to do that joint design so that we've got education pedagogy embedded into the design, into the structure of AI. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about the why. Why, why this surge and, um, you know, and talk a little bit about regulation and I think the context, let me provide some, well, actually first start with a, with a general observation, your home institution, your previous home institution was, was open like university and, and that's not too far away from Bletchley Park, correct? It's about four kilometers uh, drive from, from the campus. Yeah, that's right. The Open University, well, it's a distance learning university, but it also has a campus where um, the you know, research is carried on uh, and uh, staff are there. So there aren't students on the campus apart from PhD students, um, but that's where the, um, the campus and the research labs are situated about four miles away from Bletchley Park, where Alan Turing and thousands of other people um, developed some of the first stored program computers during the 1940s. And Absolutely. There's, and, there's and I a think fascinating that's... museum there as well, uh, a museum of computing. And you know, it's a great place to visit Bletchley Park because it really takes you back to the pioneering work on computing in the 1940s. Yeah, I was there a few years ago too. Uh, um, and, and I visited the museum. It's a very humble building and it has mm. kind of the bomb inside of it, mm. the machine that that Turing used. But but it really begs the question again of the reason. Are we, I mean, as we said, AI has been around for decades and decades and decades, but why the surge? And part of the surge, I guess, is what many are calling kind of the AI arms race. And, and, and what that means is that uh, there is a huge push towards AI sovereignty and national sovereignty. Those who actually have AI sovereignty, in other words, who can amass the technologies and the software to regulate and to use AI will have dominance, right? This is the new kind of nuclear era that we're living in. And right now the war seems to be, or the tensions seem to be growing between China and the US. And it's really kind of dictating the way that regulations are being laid out. So for example, in, in the US, uh, they have what are called voluntary guidelines and regulations that are really there to ensure that the United States is going to be prominent in this space. The EU has much more restrictive. Canada, with, with its bill uh, C-27, uh, which includes the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, is somewhere in the middle. Um, so, so understanding that complex kind of geopolitical uh, nature of why we're seeing the spike of interest, it, which is important to underscore that it's not going away. In fact, we might see a surge like we did in the 60s with technology. What is your reflections in terms of what's happening on the regulatory space in the UK? So in, in the UK, um, as in many areas, we've tended to take a compromise. So the UK government has announced that it is you know, pro-AI innovation. 
Uh, and it, as you say, the UK has a long and honorable tradition of um, developing innovative computing. Uh, and we still you know, are at the forefront of AI innovation. The company DeepMind um, is working with Google on the development of its Gemini system. So we see ourselves as a country that you know, is innovating in AI. Uh, and so the government has you know, announced a pro-AI innovation strategy, but setting in place clear guidelines and guardrails so that um, you know, the AI can be used responsibly and safely. And I'm very pleased to say that you know, in the education area, um, the Russell Group of universities, which are the 24 leading universities in the UK, including Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester, um, University of London, um, developed a set of principles for um, responsible um, but creative and innovative use of AI in education. And the principles include things like universities will support the students to become AI literate. Um, staff should be equipped to support students to use AI tools effectively and appropriately as part of a learning experience. They will adapt teaching and assessment to incorporate ethical use of AI uh, and to support equal access. They will apply academic rigor. Uh, they will share best practice. So you know, this seems to me to be, it's not, um, denying, it's not regulating AI, but it's putting in place a set of principles which they're going to abide by to use AI in responsible ways for education. And it's been uh, influential, not just amongst the Russell Group universities in the UK, but other universities that have adopted these principles and ones like it. And I, you know, I've been pleased to work with um, universities in the UK about um, developing principles, but also strategy. Um, and there is an excitement, but it's also tempered with um, a realization that universities need to change to accommodate AI. So I think um, it's, uh, there's still a long way to go. Um, so the ones that are taking the lead in the UK and in other countries are the early adopters. Uh, and, but interestingly, the early adopters uh, around the world are the students. Um, you know, recent surveys have shown that around 80 to 90 percent of students are using AI now um, as part of their studies, whereas only sort of 20 to 30 percent of adult uh, of academics and um, teachers have used AI yet. So there is a long way to go in developing AI literacy, not just among students, but amongst staff as well. And so a program of AI literacy, I think, is a real imperative. Uh, and the UK, along with many other countries, are still way behind with that. I'm trying to develop a national program of AI literacy. Um, I know the Open University, um, to go back to the OU, is developing a, a, a national course on AI literacy, but I think there's a real opportunity and a real incentive for other institutions to um, promote and to develop AI literacy among the students, but also amongst the staff, and to develop you know, agreed principles on how you will use AI in education responsibly and safely. So I think the UK has taken this middle way, as it often does, um, to say we will you know, adopt AI, we will embrace it, but we will do it in a way that is responsible, it's safe, and that safeguards you know, academic professionalism, that you know, the, going back to the idea of teaching being a caring profession, we have to care for our students uh, and care for how they use AI. And to do that, we need to set the right sort of principles and guidelines in place that empower them, but don't restrict them. It, and I'm glad that you mentioned the Russell Group because the Russell Group uh, document, along with uh, the UN, they have the guidance for generative AI in education and research that was published last year. And there's been a number of others. They are beginning to fill a void and a void that many are listening to. And in fact, I know that 
many colleagues across the country have made reference to the Russell Group in terms of kind of progressing uh, the dialogue. Uh, and I also do know that, you know, Arizona State, like university, which uh, is the, one of the first in the states to actually have a contract with OpenAI, is looking at these documents in order to be able to define what they're going to be doing in this space. But it really also gets into a really important question that let's not get too distracted with the, the new shiny thing in the room. At the heart of all this, if this is going to work, we have to align it with learning theories. We have to align it with updated pedagogies. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about uh, the meaning of conversational frameworks, what that means, and how it could be applied to an AI uh, system. Okay. It's something that I've been interested in and worked with for a number of years. So the idea behind a conversational framework is that, uh, and it comes from a great theorist and practitioner, um, Gordon Pask, who worked in the 1970s up to the 1990s, not only developing you know, theories of learning, but also developing some of the earliest adaptive teaching systems, tutoring systems. And the idea behind conversational threat framework is that all learning involves conversation, that we converse with ourselves as we reflect on our knowledge, uh, as we, you know, consider our limitations, as we argue with ourselves, we converse with our peers um, to try and understand their perspective uh, and peer learning uh, and peer review and what's called teach back. So saying what you know, uh, adjusting your knowledge in relation to your peer is a really powerful way of learning. And then we converse with teachers, people who have more expertise and more knowledge. So conversation is you know, an essential aspect of learning. And if you take a systems view, then you know, what is a conversational system? It's you know, a set of these conversational agents who are interacting with each other. Now, us back in the 1970s realized that you know, conversations can take place not only amongst humans, but also amongst humans and machines that if you can have machines that form as language agents, um, for example, doing machine translation, uh, doing uh, adaptive tutoring, then you can have extended conversations. Um, and to take part in those conversations, a machine doesn't have to act like a human. It just has to you know, engage in uh, a discourse in you know, a natural language. So you can have conversations amongst humans and machines. Now, I think that the way in which generative AI is evolving is fairly similar to the World Wide Web, that it started off with a research project and then there was a big breakthrough with AI. It was in the transformer architecture. Then it became commercialized just as the web did. Then it got embedded into tools and what happened next with the web was it became social. Um, so social media for all it's good and ill. And I think that's going to happen with AI, that you're going to have AI systems that you can not just interact with one-to-one, -one, but interact with socially. Um, so AI is going to become embedded into social media. And also you're going to get AI systems uh, conversing with each other. So you're going to have these machine-supported conversations. Now, again, that's both hugely powerful uh, and you know, hugely um, engaging and empowering, but also hugely dangerous. Um, because if, for example, if we don't know whether we're conversing with an AI or with a human, or if you've got um, the powerful AI systems that are spreading disinformation, they can be hugely dangerous. They can also be hugely empowering because, as I said, AI can bring a perspective that humans can't. They can analyze data. Uh, they can do forecasting. So if we can, you know, it's going to come, this social AI. So we have to think about uh, how we manage and control it. And from an educational point of view, thinking about not just how we do one-to-one -one personalized learning with AI, how we manage group learning, how we manage collaborative learning, peer tutoring, uh, how we can engage in the sort of um, 
conversations that you do over Teams or Zoom where AI is a participant. So I think we have to look forward to a new era of conversational AI powered um, education. And I don't think we've yet got to grips with what that means. What does it mean when AI is uh, engaging in our conversations? Absolutely. And I think that it does beg the necessity for public discourse. You know, public discourse, again, on the motives behind AI, public discourse on the environmental impact of AI, the amount of water and energy being used. And, exactly. you know, so all of these things and, and, and the ethics and the biases and the potential. But as we know, because of the motivations, the factors are not going to go away. One of the really interesting things that you're saying is that for the probably for the first time, what AI could do if done correctly is finally bridge the gap between informal and formal learning. In other words, underscore the value of lifelong learning for the individual. Yes, AI could be a lifelong learning tool. It could be a, a guide, a mentor, not only to individuals, but also to groups, to communities. You know? And to do that, you know, it needs to have some things that it doesn't at the moment. It needs to have persistent memory, for example. Um, it needs to be able you know, to support you, not just in a conversation, but in multiple co conversations. And it also needs to understand something about you in terms of your interests, your likes, your desires, if it's going to act as this you know, personal lifelong aid. And so again, you have this benefit and risk. And the benefit is that it can support you through a learning journey throughout a lifetime. The risk is that it's going to collect a lot of information about you and about your interactions, basically everything that you do online and with other people. Mm -hmm. And it can you know, use that for good or for ill. Now, I'm not saying I'm an advocate for this kind of lifelong social conversational AI. But what I'm saying is it's likely to come. We need to recognize that it's likely to come in the way that we didn't recognize that social media was coming in the you know, mid 1990s. We need to recognize that social AI is coming and try to manage it in ways that support you know, active learning, learning as conversation, um, group-based learning that can be enormously powerful, but with risks attached. Absolutely. One of the powers of the web is that you can go back in time. Um, so in, 20, in 2008, uh, you were giving a talk and you were predicting the future and you were saying that uh, you were kind of looking at 2002, you made some predictions, you made some new predictions in 2008. One of them that you made was the uh, the future of disruption and connection based on mobile devices and the whitening gap uh, of what is sanctioned in the classroom and what goes on at the individual level. Yes. If I were to ask you now in, in 2024, what would be your predictions? I think you kind of hinted at that, but what would be your predictions in the next 10 years in this space? Right. So... I think the next 10 years, in just the same way that we now don't talk about mobile devices or mobile learning, it isn't you know, a thing. It's just everywhere. We you know, assume that we're going to use our mobile devices for interaction, for learning, uh, for media. I think the same is going to be true of AI. So um, within 10 years, um, AI is just going to be ubiquitous. Um, it's going to power all the things that we do. And we will have become used to interacting with AI. So in the same way that there are now discussions about you know, has you know, mobile technology become far too dominant, um, you know, all the arguments about taking mobile phones into schools, into classrooms at the moment, um, should students leave these behind, I think the same is going to be true of AI that what are the limits of AI? Um, and that's going to be really difficult to do, um, but I think we will need to find spaces that are AI free, where we can have human to human conversations, 
where we can explore our humanness, where we can explore human experience. So I think that's what's going to happen in 10 years time. AI will be ubiquitous, just as mobile devices are ubiquitous now. And we need to find out what other human spaces, what makes us truly human um, the, and where we don't need to rely on machines. And that's going to be a challenge for the future. Thanks for that. Um, and that's a really powerful um, point to leave off on. And, you know, I think that as AI becomes much more immersive and much more commonplace, I think that we need to find space for humanity. We need to find space yeah. for the implications of this technology. We need to find space to be able to have our own agency in terms of how we use these kind of technologies to leverage and to improve the conditions of those around the world that are using and who are in dire need of education and opportunity. Um, so, Mike, I would like to thank you so much for your time. I, I honestly think, I think I, I wrote to this, you know, yesterday when we exchanged an email, this could have been a three-hour conversation to, you know, scratch the surface on these really important topics and 50 minutes doesn't really uh, do justice. Um, we will make an effort. Uh, I know that there are questions uh, in the uh, in the chat uh, to look at the questions and provide maybe a, a response to those questions. Uh, and if you I want to give us a couple of days and we can get to those. Uh, again, I, I do apologize that we haven't addressed them specifically during this webinar, but we will be addressing them and we will post the questions and the uh, and the answers uh, in, in the coming days. Um, so um, again, Mike, I would really like to thank you for your uh, expertise, your lifelong um, commitment it you know to this field that's really made a an impact and uh, for your time to be with us today karen over to you thank you thanks rod thank you both for a truly captivating conversation that you've shared with us today um it's been very enlightening and i'm sure our audience found great value in in this conversation as well on behalf of the Division of Extended Education at the U of M, I'd like to thank all of our webinar participants for joining us today. And please note you're going to get a brief survey immediately after the session to provide any comments or feedback that you'd like to share with us. And be sure to mark your calendars for the next webinar on Friday, April 5th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We hope you'll join us for another conversation where we delve into the ethics and challenges of generative AI, focusing on the biases inherent in the data and information it's trained on. Our guests will be Sophia Noble, who leads UCLA's Center on Race and Digital Justice and the Mindaroo Initiative on Tech and Power, and Cecil Rossner, who is a respected figure in Canadian investigative journalism. Thank you once more for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>